the third module of the intro lecture is about um, the scientific challenge behind brain-computer interfaces. So what is difficult about the problem? Um, why is it hard? Uh, why do you need a lecture, as I said? So um, we'll talk a little bit about where the field is situated in, in the context of all the different scientific fields um, that are related. Um, the first one is the theory that BCI entails is sort of interdisciplinary. And uh, it, it overlaps quite a bit with things like signal processing, machine learning, um, because you need this adaptivity and so on, uh, computational intelligence, uh, and related fields on one hand. And then on the other hand, it's neuroscience, it's cognitive science, psychology, and so on. There's also a bit of physics mixed in, because you know electrical um, phenomena require a little bit of electrical engineering, for example, or physics to understand. And the, the problems that BCI addresses actually are very similar to problems that people have in computer vision, where you have you know, a, a pixel array and you're trying to find patterns in there and say, this is a cat, this is a dog, and so on. It's essentially, it's very much related to what people do with EEG and so on, and fMRI and BCI, pattern recognition in a sense. Speech recognition is also very similar. Because in speech, you have lots of time structure between vowels and words and so on that you need to exploit to do a good job. And you have the exact same thing in, in brain-computer interfaces. We have, it's just not audio, it's EEG. And then there's various other areas like time series analysis, control systems, and ro robotics, where it's about, you know, you have, you have a goal. How do you move your, you know, your robotic arm there and things like that, which is relevant for uh, clinical populations who want to control things and so on. And there is one specific reason, uh, which is sort of the key reason why it's difficult. And that is whatever you do in your BCI, the, the actual processing, depends on a bunch of parameters. And these parameters are not really known a priori. You have lots of uncertainty about them. That may be because they're specific to the person or specific to the task that the person is doing and things like that. And here's a somewhat striking example of person-specific variability. So that's importance maps, or you can say weights or patterns, for four different people doing the same task. And you see they vary quite a bit. But <laughs> importantly, they actually vary so much that in some cases, you have you know, the opposite sign in the map. So if you use this person's model on another person, you get the exact wrong output. And so you really need to adapt um, to the person to be able to do a good job. And there's, there's reasons for that, variability. One is that the cortex is folded differently for every person. And so um, the signals project into different areas and so on. That's even for twins who are, who are monozygotic, uh, quite surprisingly, like a fingerprint. Um, the functional map or allocation might be different for people, or it might be larger and some smaller than others, uh, in others. Um, and on every recording session, your sensors are sli placed slightly differently, which gives you variability. So this is session to session. And uh, then the brain dynamics themselves are non-stationary. And they change from second to second, minute to minute, day to day, year to year, so at all time scales. And so uh, if you go from one week to the next, there's something that has changed and that you might need to adapt to. Uh, and if you ignore it, your performance will suffer to some extent. So these are some of the, the main reasons. And there's a few others. I'll just bring these up. Um, the signal is very, um, there's a high signal to noise ratio, you can say. Uh, sorry, a difficult to deal with signal to noise ratio. It's actually low. Um, and so whatever you pull out, it's going to be very noisy. And so you have a hard time making something very speci you know, specific, uh, sorry, sensitive. So, um, you know. That's, that's a very big deal in brain-computer interfaces. And another one is that whatever you measure usually measures you know, part of your brain, say. And that part does other things other than the stuff that you care about. And so for this reason, it's very hard to be specific to just one phenomenon with a brain-computer interface. You thought you were measuring, say, imagined movements, but it turns out you also pick up, say, sensory experiences on the same limbs or so because the neural populations perhaps do some of the same functions or they're right next to other populations that happen to have these functions. And that's a very big deal and can be 
very misleading in science if you're looking at one thing, say, I'm doing this perfectly well, but then if you try the same technology on, on another situation, it gives completely wrong results or so. And the last one is we don't yet fully understand um, how the brain works, right? <laughs> in fact, we have lots of uncertainty about that. And so in some cases, we don't even know what to look for, how to look for it, and so on. So that's, of course, also fundamentally hard and scientifically interesting and challenging. Um, lastly, I should say there's one thing that's specific about EEG, and that is you may have 64 sensors, but every sensor basically gives you about the same curve, you know, the, the same time series. Uh, they are only slightly different, and that is because I show you there's, um, there's, it depends on conduction in the brain um, that gives rise to, to this redundancy. Um, and so for this reason, you actually need to disentangle the signal uh, computationally. And that requires some statistics. So in EEG, you have this issue. You don't have it in, say, fMRI as much. But it can definitely be handled. It's luckily uh, a linear phenomenon. I, I say what that means later. So as a result, you, you need sophisticated signal processing. You, whatever you do needs to be statistical because you have uncertainty. And also, because there's so much stuff that you don't know in advance, you need to calibrate a BCI. You need to start with some data and adapt some parameters, some data from that person, ideally. And um, lastly, um, whatever you use for calibration, <laughs> it should uh, in, incorporate as much information about the person, about the task, and things like that that you can get. Uh, that may include example data, like here's a chunk of EEG where the person was surprised, here's one where he wasn't surprised, here's another where he was surprised, and so on. That's extremely useful. And other prior knowledge that you may have, such as I think surprise happens here in the brain, or, or a database which contains data from 100 people who had that same kind of phenomenon. Um, expressing them, which you can use to constrain your solutions and so on.